A Discourse Delivered to the Students of the Royal Academy on the Distribution of the Prizes, December 10th, 1771, by the President. Gentlemen, the value and rank of every art is in proportion to the mental labor employed in it, or the mental pleasure produced by it. As this principle is observed or neglected, our profession becomes either a liberal art or a mechanical trade. In the hands of one man it makes the highest pretensions, as it is addressed to the noblest faculties, in those of another it is reduced to a mere matter of ornament, and the painter has but the humble province of furnishing our apartments with elegance. This exertion of mind, which is the only circumstance that truly ennobles our art, makes the great distinction between the Roman and Venetian schools. I have formerly observed that perfect form is produced by leaving out particularities and retaining only general ideas. I shall now endeavor to show that this principle, which I have proved to be metaphysically just, extends itself to every part of the art, that it gives what is called the grand style to invention, to composition, to expression, and even to coloring and drapery. Invention in painting does not imply the invention of the subject, for that is commonly supplied by the poet or historian. With respect to the choice, no subject can be proper that is not generally interesting, it ought to be either some eminent instance of heroic action or heroic suffering. There must be something either in the action or in the object in which men are universally concerned, and which powerfully strikes upon the public sympathy. Strictly speaking, indeed, no subject can be of universal, hardly can it be of general, concern. But there are events and characters so popularly known in those countries where our art is in request, that they may be considered as sufficiently general for all our purposes. Such are the great events of Greek and Roman fable and history, which early education and the usual course of reading have made familiar and interesting to all Europe without being degraded by the vulgarism of ordinary life in any country. Such, too, are the capital subjects of scripture history, which, besides their general notoriety, become venerable by their connection with our religion. As it is required that the subject selected should be a general one, it is no less necessary that it should be kept unembarrassed with whatever may any way serve to divide the attention of the spectator. Whenever a story is related, every man forms a picture in his mind of the action and the expression of the persons employed. The power of representing this mental picture in canvas is what we call invention in a painter, and as in the conception of this ideal picture the mind does not enter into the minute peculiarities of the dress, furniture, or scene of action, so when the painter comes to represent it, he contrives those little necessary concomitant circumstances in such a manner that they shall strike the spectator no more than they did himself in his first conception of the story. I am very ready to allow that some circumstances of minuteness and particularity frequently tend to give an air of truth to a piece, and to interest the spectator in an extraordinary manner. Such circumstances, therefore, cannot wholly be rejected. But if there be anything in the art which requires peculiar nicety of discernment, it is the disposition of these minute circumstantial parts which, according to the judgment employed in the choice, become so useful to truth or so injurious to grandeur. However, the usual and most dangerous error is on the side of minuteness, and therefore I think caution most necessary where most have failed. The general idea constitutes real excellence. All smaller things, however perfect in their way, are to be sacrificed without mercy to the greater. The painter will not inquire what things may be admitted without much censure. He will not think it enough to show that they may be there. He will show that they must be there, that their absence would render his picture maimed and defective. Thus, though to the principal group a second or third be added, and a second and third mass of light, care must be yet taken that those subordinate actions and lights neither each in particular nor all together, come into any degree of competition with the principle. They should make a part of that whole which would be imperfect without them. To every part of painting this rule may be applied. Even in portraits the grace and, we may add, the likeness consists more in taking the general air than in observing the effect similitude of every feature. Thus figures must have a ground whereon to stand, they must be clothed, there must be a background, there must be light and shadow but none of these ought to appear to have taken up any part of the artist's attention. They should be so managed as not even to catch that of the spectator. We know well enough, when we analyze a piece, the difficulty and the subtlety with which an artist adjusts the background, drapery, and masses of light. We know that a considerable part of the grace and effect of his picture depends upon them, but this art is so much concealed, 
even to a judicious eye, that no remains of these subordinate parts occur to memory when the picture is not present. The great end of the art is to strike the imagination. The painter is, therefore, to make no ostentation of the means by which this is done. The spectator is only to feel the result in his bosom. An inferior artist is unwilling that any part of his industry should be lost upon the spectator. He takes as much pains to discover as the greater artist does to conceal the marks of his subordinate assiduity. In works of the lower kind, everything appears studied and encumbered. It is all boastful art and open affectation. The ignorant often part with such pictures with wonder in their mouths and indifference in their hearts. But it is not enough in invention that the artist should restrain and keep under all the inferior parts of his subject. He must sometimes deviate from vulgar and strict historical truth in pursuing the grandeur of his design. How much the great style exacts from its professors to conceive and represent their subjects in a poetical manner, not confined to mere matter of fact, may be seen in the cartoons of Raphael. In all the pictures in which the painter has represented the apostles, he has drawn them with great nobleness. He has given them as much dignity as the human figure is capable of receiving. Yet we are expressly told in Scripture that they had no such respectable appearance. And of St. Paul in particular we are told by himself that his bodily presence was mean. Alexander is said to have been of a low stature. A painter ought not so to represent him. Gesalaus was low, lame, and of a mean appearance. None of these defects ought to appear in a piece of which he is the hero. In conformity to custom, I call this part of the art history painting. It ought to be called poetical, as in reality it is. All this not falsifying any fact, it is taking an allowed poetical license. A painter of portraits retains the individual likeness. A painter of history shows the man by showing his actions. A painter must compensate the natural deficiencies of his art. He has but one sentence to utter, but one moment to exhibit. He cannot, like the poet or historian, expatiate and impress the mind with great veneration for the character of the hero or saint he represents, though he lets us know at the same time that the saint was deformed or the hero lame. The painter has no other means of giving an idea of the dignity of the mind but by that external appearance which grandeur of thought does generally, though not always, impress on the countenance, and by that correspondence of figure to sentiment and situation which all men wish but cannot command. The painter, who may in this one particular attain with ease what others desire in vain, ought to give all that he possibly can, since there are so many circumstances of true greatness that he cannot give at all. He cannot make his hero talk like a great man. He must make him look like one, for which reason he ought to be well studied in the analysis of those circumstances which constitute dignity of appearance in real life. As in invention, so likewise in expression, care must be taken not to run into particularities. Those expressions alone should be given to the figures which their respective situations generally produce. Nor is this enough. Each person should also have that expression which men of his rank generally exhibit. The joy or the grief of a character of dignity is not to be expressed in the same manner as a similar passion in a vulgar face. Upon this principle Bernini, perhaps, may be subject to censure. This sculptor, in many respects admirable, has given a very mean expression to his statue of David, who is represented as just going to throw the stone from the sling, and in order to give it the expression of energy he has made him biting his underlip. This expression is far from being general, and still farther from being dignified. He might have seen it in an instance or two, and he mistook accident for universality. With respect to colouring, though it may appear at first a part of painting merely mechanical, yet it still has its rules, and those grounded upon that presiding principle which regulates both the great and the little in a study of a painter. By this the first effect of the picture is produced, and as this is performed the spectator, as he walks the gallery, will stop or pass along. To give a general air of grandeur at first view, all trifling or artful play of little lights or an attention to a variety of tints is to be avoided. A quietness and simplicity must reign over the whole work, to which a breadth of uniform and simple color will very much contribute. Grandeur of effect is produced by two different ways, which seem entirely opposed to each other. One is, by reducing the colors to little more than chiaroscuro, which was often the practice of the Bolognian schools and the other by making the colors very distinct and forcible, such as we see in those of Rome and Florence. But still the presiding principle of both those manners is simplicity. Certainly nothing can be more simple than monotony, and the distinct blue, red, and yellow colors which are seen in the draperies of the Roman and Florentine schools 
though they have not that kind of harmony which is produced by a variety of broken and transparent colors, have that effect of grandeur that was intended. Perhaps these distinct colors strike the mind more forcibly, from there not being any great union between them, as martial music, which is intended to rouse the noble passions, has its effects from the sudden and strongly marked transitions from one note to another, which that style of music requires. Whilst in that which is intended to move the softer passions, the notes imperceptibly melt into one another. In the same manner as the historical painter never enters into the detail of colors, so neither does he debase his conceptions with minute attention to the discriminations of drapery. It is the inferior style that marks the variety of stuffs. With him the clothing is neither woolen nor linen nor silk, satin nor velvet. It is drapery. It is nothing more. The art of disposing the foldings of the drapery make a very considerable part of the painter's study. To make it merely natural, it is a mechanical operation to which neither genius or taste are required, whereas it requires the nicest judgment to dispose the drapery so that the folds have an easy communication and gracefully follow each other with such natural negligence as to look like the effect of chance, and at the same time to show the figure under it to the utmost advantage. Carlo Moratti was of opinion that the disposition of drapery was a more difficult art than even that of drawing the human figure, that a student might be more easily taught the latter than the former, as the rules of drapery, he said, could not be so well ascertained as those for delineating a correct form. This, perhaps, is a proof how willingly we favor our own peculiar excellence, Carlo Moratti is said to have valued himself particularly upon his skill in this part of the art, yet in him the disposition appears so artificial that he is inferior to Raphael, even in that which gave him the best claim to reputation. Such is the great principle by which we must be directed in the nobler branches of our art. Upon this principle the Roman, the Florentine, the Bolognese schools have formed their practice, and by this they have deservedly obtained the highest praise. These are the three great schools of the world in the epic style. The best of the French school, Poussin, Le Soeur, and Le Brun, have formed themselves upon these models, and consequently may be said, though Frenchmen, to be a colony from the Roman school. Next to these, but in a very different style of excellence, we may rank the Venetian, together with the Flemish and the Dutch schools, all professing to depart from the great purposes of painting and catching at applause by inferior qualities. I am not ignorant that some will censure me for placing the Venetians in this inferior class, and many of the warmest admirers of painting will think them unjustly degraded, but I wish not to be misunderstood. Though I can by no means allow them to hold any rank with the nobler schools of painting, they accomplished perfectly the thing they attempted, but as mere elegance is their principal object, as they seem more willing to dazzle than to affect, it can be no injury to them to suppose that their practice is useful only to its proper end but what may heighten the elegant may degrade the sublime. There is a simplicity, and I may add, severity in the great manner, which is, I am afraid, almost incompatible with this comparatively sensual style. Tintoret, Paul Veronese, and others of the Venetian schools seem to have painted with no other purpose than to be admired for their skill and expertness in the mechanism of painting, and to make a parade of that art which, as I before observed, the higher style requires its followers to conceal. In a conference of the French Academy, at which were present Le Brun, Sebastian Bourdon, and all the eminent artists of that age, one of the academicians desired to have their opinion on the conduct of Paul Veronese, who, though a painter of great consideration, had contrary to the strict rules of art in his picture of Perseus and Andromeda, represented the principal figure in shade. To this question no satisfactory answer was then given, but I will venture to say that if they had considered the class of the artist and ranked him as an ornamental painter, there would have been no difficulty in answering. It was unreasonable to expect what was never intended. His intention was solely to produce an effect of light and shadow. Everything was to be sacrificed to that intent, and the capricious composition of that picture suited very well with the style he professed. Young minds are indeed too apt to be captivated by this splendor of style, and that of the Venetians will be particularly pleasing for by them all those parts of style that give pleasure to the eye or sense have been cultivated with care and carried to the degree nearest to perfection. The powers exerted in the mechanical part of the art have been called the language of painters, but we must say that it is poor eloquence which only shows that the orator can talk. Words should be employed as the means, not as the end. Language is the instrument, conviction is the work. The language of painting must indeed be allowed these masters, 
but even in that they have shown more copiousness than choice, and more luxuriancy than judgment. If we consider the uninteresting subjects of their invention, or at least the uninteresting manner in which they are treated, if we attend to their capricious composition, their violent and affected contrasts, whether of figures or of light and shadow, the richness of their drapery, and at the same time the mean effect which the discrimination of stuffs gives to their pictures, if to these we add their total inattention to expression, and then reflect on the conceptions in the learning of Michelangelo, or the simplicity of Raphael, we can no longer dwell on the comparison. Even in coloring, if we compare the quietness and chastity of the Bolognese pencil to the bustle and tumult that fills every part of a Venetian picture, without the least attempt to interest the passions, their boasted art will appear a mere struggle without effect, an empty tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Such as suppose that the great style might happily be blended with the ornamental, that the simple, grave, and majestic dignity of Raphael could unite with the glow and bustle of Apollo or Tintoret are totally mistaken. The principles by which each are attained are so contrary to each other that they seem, in my opinion, incompatible, and is impossible to exist together as to unite in the mind at the same time the most sublime ideas and the lowest sensuality. The subject of the Venetian painters are mostly such as give them an opportunity of introducing a great number of figures, such as feasts, marriages, and processions, public martyrdoms, or miracles. I can easily conceive that Paul Veronese, if he were asked, would say that no subject was proper for an historical picture, but such as admitted at least forty figures, for in a less number, he would assert, there could be no opportunity of the painter's showing his art in composition, his dexterity of managing and disposing the masses of light and groups of figures, and of introducing a variety of eastern dresses and characters in their rich stuffs. But the thing is very different with a pupil of the greater schools. Annabel Caracci thought twelve figures sufficient for any story. He conceived that more would contribute to no end but to fill space, that they would but be cold spectators of the general action, or, to use his own expression, that they would be figures to be let. Besides, it is impossible for a picture composed of so many parts to have that effect so indispensably necessary to grandeur of one complete whole. However contradictory it may be in geometry, it is true in taste that many little things will not make a great one. The sublime impresses the mind at once with one great idea. It is a single blow. The elegant indeed may be produced by a repetition, by an accumulation of many minute circumstances. However great the difference is between the composition of the Venetian and the rest of the Italian schools, there is full as great a disparity in the effect of their pictures as produced by colors. And though in this respect the Venetians must be allowed extraordinary skill, yet even in that skill, as they have employed it, will but ill correspond with the great style. Their coloring is not only too brilliant, but I will venture to say, too harmonious to produce that solidity steadiness and simplicity of effect which heroic subjects require and which simple or grave colors only can give to a work. That they are to be cautiously studied by those who are ambitious of treading the great walk of history is confirmed, if it wants confirmation, by the greatest of all authorities, Michelangelo. This wonderful man, after having seen a picture by Titian, told Vasari who accompanied him that he liked much his coloring and manner. But then he added that it was a pity the Venetian painters did not learn to draw correctly in their early youth and adopt a better manner of study. By this it appears that the principal attention of the Venetian painters, in the opinion of Michelangelo, seemed to be engrossed by the study of colors, to the neglect of the ideal beauty of form, or propriety of expression. But if general censure was given to that school from the sight of a picture of Titian, how much more justly would the censure fall on Paolo Veronese, or more especially on Tintoret? And here I cannot avoid citing Vasari's opinion of the style and manner of Tintoret. Of all the extraordinary geniuses, says he, that have ever practiced the art of painting, for wild, capricious, extravagant, and fantastical inventions, for furious impetuosity and boldness in the execution of his work, there is none like Tintoret. His strange whims are even beyond extravagance, and his works seem to be produced rather by chance than in consequence of any previous design as if he wanted to convince the world that the art was a trifle and of the most easy attainment. For my own part, when I speak of the Venetian painters, I wish to be understood to mean Paolo Veronese and Tintoret to the exclusion of Titian, for though his style is not so pure as that of many others of the Italian schools, yet there is a sort of senatorial dignity about him, which, however awkward in his imitators, seems to become him exceedingly. 
His portraits alone from the nobleness and simplicity of character which he always gave them will entitle him to the greatest respect, as he undoubtedly stands in the first rank in this branch of the art. It is not with Titian, but with the seducing qualities of the two former, that I could wish to caution you against being too much captivated. These are the persons who may be said to have exhausted all the powers of florid eloquence, to debauch the young and unexperienced, and have, without doubt, been the cause of turning off the attention of the connoisseur and of the patron of art, as well as that of the painter, from those higher excellences of which the art is capable, and which ought to be required in every considerable production. By them and their imitators a style merely ornamental has been disseminated throughout all Europe. Rubens carried it to Flanders, Voet to France, and Luca Giordano to Spain and Naples. The Venetian is indeed the most splendid of the schools of elegance, and it is not without reason that the best performances in this lower school are valued higher than the second-rate performances of those above them, for every picture has value when it has a decided character, and is excellent in its kind. But the student must take care not to be so much dazzled with this splendor as to be tempted to imitate what must ultimately lead from perfection. Poussin, whose eye was always steadily fixed on the sublime, has been often heard to say that a particular attention to coloring was an obstacle to the student in his progress to the great end and design of the art, and that he who attaches himself to this principal end will acquire by practice a reasonably good method of coloring. Though it be allowed that elaborate harmony of coloring, a brilliancy of tints, a soft and gradual transition from one to another, present to the eye what an harmonious concert of music does to the ear, it must be remembered that a painting is not merely a gratification of the sight. Such excellence, though properly cultivated when nothing higher than elegance is intended, is weak and unworthy of regard when the work aspires to grandeur and sublimity. The same reasons that have been urged why a mixture of the Venetian style cannot improve the great style will hold good in regard to the Flemish and Dutch schools. Indeed, the Flemish school, of which Rubens is the head, was formed upon that of the Venetian. Like them, he took his figures too much from the people before him, but it must be allowed in favor of the Venetians that he was more gross than they, and carried all their mistaken methods to a far greater excess. In the Venetian school itself, where they all err from the same cause, there is a difference in the effect. The difference between Paolo and Bassano seems to be only that one introduced Venetian gentlemen into his pictures, and the other the boors of the district of Bassano, and called them patriarchs and prophets. The painters of the Dutch school have still more locality. With them a history piece is properly a portrait of themselves. Whether they describe the inside or outside of their houses, we have their own people and their own peculiar occupations, working or drinking, playing or fighting. The circumstances that enter into a picture of this kind are so far from giving a general view of human life that they exhibit all the minute particularities of a nation differing in several respects from the rest of mankind. Yet let them have their share of more humble praise. The painters of this school are excellent in their own way. They are only ridiculous when they attempt general history on their own narrow principles and debase great events by the meanness of their characters. Some inferior dexterity, some extraordinary mechanical power, is apparently that from which they seek distinction. Thus we see that school alone has the custom of representing candlelight, not as it really appears to us by night, but red as it would illuminate objects to a spectator by day. Such tricks, however pardonable in the little style where petty effects are the sole end, are inexcusable in the greater, where the attention should never be drawn aside by trifles, but should be entirely occupied by the subject itself. The same local principles which characterize the Dutch school extend even to their landscape painters, and Rubens himself, who has painted many landscapes, has sometimes transgressed in this particular. Their pieces in this way are, I think, always a representation of an individual spot, and each in its kind a very faithful but very confined portrait. Claude Lorraine, on the contrary, was convinced that taking nature as he found it seldom produced beauty. His pictures are a composition of the various drafts which he made previously from various beautiful scenes and prospects. However, Rubens, in some measure, has made amends for the deficiency with which he is charged. He has contrived to raise and animate his otherwise uninteresting views by introducing a rainbow, a storm, or some particular accidental effect of light. That the practice of Claude Lorraine in respect to his choice is to be adopted by landscape painters, in opposition to that of the Flemish and Dutch schools, there can be no doubt, as its truth is founded upon the same principle as that by which the historical painter acquires perfect form. But whether landscape painting has a right to aspire so far as to reject what the painters call 
accidents of nature, is not easy to determine. It is certain Claude Lorraine seldom, if ever, availed himself of those accidents. Either he thought that such peculiarities were contrary to that style of general nature which he professed, or that it would catch the attention too strongly and destroy that quietness and repose which he thought necessary to that kind of painting. A portrait painter likewise, when he attempts history, unless he is upon his guard, is likely to enter too much into the detail. He too frequently makes his historical heads look like portraits, and this was once the custom amongst those old painters who revived the art before general ideas were practiced or understood. A history painter paints man in general, a portrait painter a particular man, and consequently a defective model. Thus, an habitual practice in the lower exercises of the art will prevent many from attaining the greater. But such of us who move in these humbler walks of the profession are not ignorant that, as the natural dignity of the subject is less, the more all the little ornamental helps are necessary to its embellishment. It would be ridiculous for a painter of domestic scenes, of portraits, landscapes, animals, or of still life to say that he despised those qualities which have made the subordinate schools so famous. The art of coloring and the skillful management of light and shadow are essential requisites in his confined labors. If we descend still lower, what is the painter of fruit and flowers without the utmost art in coloring, and what the painters call handling? That is, a lightness of pencil that implies great practice, and gives the appearance of being done with ease. Some here, I believe, must remember a flower painter whose boast it was that he scorned to paint for the million. No, he professed to paint in the true Italian taste, and despising the crowd called strenuously upon the few to admire him. His idea of the Italian taste was to paint as black and dirty as he could, and to leave all clearness and brilliancy of coloring to those who were fonder of money than of immortality. The consequence was such as might be expected. For these pretty excellences are here essential beauties, and without his merit the artist's work will be more short-lived than the objects of his imitation. From what has been advanced, we must now be convinced that there are two distinct styles in history painting, the grand and the splendid or ornamental. The great style stands alone, and does not require, perhaps does not so well admit, any addition from inferior beauties. The ornamental style also possesses its own peculiar merit. However, though the union of the two may make a sort of composite style, yet that style is likely to be more imperfect than either of those which go to its composition. Both kinds have merit, and may be excellent, though in different ranks, if uniformity be preserved, and the general and particular ideas of nature be not mixed. Even the meanest of them is difficult enough to attain, and the first place being already occupied by the great artists in either department, some of those who followed thought there was less room for them, and feeling the impulse of ambition and the desire of novelty, and being at the same time perhaps willing to take the shortest way, they endeavored to make for themselves a place between both. This they have effected by forming a union of the different orders, but as the grave and majestic style would suffer by a union with the florid and gay, so also has the Venetian ornament in some respect been injured by attempting an alliance with simplicity. It may be asserted that the great style is always more or less contaminated by any meaner mixture, but it happens in a few instances that the lower may be improved by borrowing from the grand. Thus, if a portrait painter is desirous to raise and improve his subject, he has no other means than by approaching it to a general idea. He leaves out all the minute breaks and peculiarities in the face and changes the dress from a temporary fashion to one more permanent, which has annexed to it no ideas of meanness from its being familiar to us. But if an exact resemblance of an individual be considered as the sole object to be aimed at, the portrait painter will be apt to lose more than he gains by the acquired dignity taken from general nature. It is very difficult to ennoble the character of a countenance, but at the expense of the likeness, which is what is most generally required by such as sit to the painter. Of those who have practiced the composite style and have succeeded in this perilous attempt, perhaps the foremost is Correggio. His style is founded upon modern grace and elegance to which is superadded something of the simplicity of the grand style, a breadth of light and color, the general ideas of the drapery, an uninterrupted flow of outline all conspire to this effect. Next him, perhaps equal to him, Parmigiano has dignified the gentleness of modern effeminacy by uniting it with the simplicity of the ancients and the grandeur and severity of Michelangelo. It must be confessed, however, that these two extraordinary men, by endeavoring to give the utmost degree of grace, have sometimes perhaps exceeded its boundaries, and have fallen into the most hateful of all hateful qualities, affectation. 
Indeed, it is the more peculiar characteristic of men of genius to be afraid of coldness and insipidity, from which they think they never can be too far removed. It particularly happens to those great masters of grace and elegance. They often boldly drive on to the very verge of ridicule. The spectator is alarmed, but at the same time admires their vigor and intrepidity. Strange graces still, and stranger flights they had, yet ne'er so sure our passion to create, I when they touch the brink of all we hate. The errors of genius, however, are pardonable, and none even of the more exalted painters are wholly free from them, but they have taught us by the rectitude of their general practice to correct their own affected or accidental deviation. The very first have not been always upon their guard, and perhaps there is not a fault, but what may take shelter under the most venerable authorities. Yet that style only is perfect, in which the noblest principles are uniformly pursued, and those masters only are entitled to the first rank in, our estimation, who have enlarged the boundaries of their art, and have raised it to its highest dignity, by exhibiting the general ideas of nature. On the whole, it seems to me that there is but one presiding principle which regulates and gives stability to every art. The works, whether of poets, painters, moralists, or historians which are built upon general nature, live forever, while those which depend for their existence on particular customs and habits, a partial view of nature, or the fluctuation of fashion, can only be coeval with that which first raised them from obscurity. Present time and future may be considered as rivals, and he who solicits the one must expect to be discountenanced by the other.